introductory note. I do, I do welcome you to worship on the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. I also would like to you know, invite you and uh, the congregation and the visitors to come to our in-person services. There are three at the moment, one on Thursday evening uh, and two on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock in uh, German and at 11 o'clock in English. Just uh, to inform you about our worship times, and again, feel free to stop by, feel free to worship with us. Thanks for being here this evening, and uh, as for our opening hymn, we hear how firm a foundation. We have gathered for worship on the 10th Sunday after Pentecost in the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse us out of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a call and minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. O Lord, my stronghold, my crag and my haven. My God, my rock in whom I put my trust, my shield, 
the horn of my salvation and my refuge. You are worthy of praise. I will call upon the Lord, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. The breakers of death rolled over me, and the torrents of oblivion made me afraid. The cords of hell entangled me, and the snares of death were set for me. I called upon the Lord in my distress and cried out to my God for help. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, in the midst of the storms of life, Christ's presence brings eternal peace and calms our fears. Grant us peace through scripture and through the bread and wine of Holy Communion. Then send us forth to be signs of Christ's peace in the world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly. You are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We uh, hear our next hymn, Jesus Calls Us Over the Tumult.
Praise and peace to you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let me start with a joke. And I'm not telling it just for the sake of telling a joke. Nor do I want to make fun of our gospel text in which we just heard how Jesus walked on water. Surely it is a difficult passage, that invites us to wrestle with the text. And I hope you don't mind that I chose a humorous approach to break open the text. Story has it that three of the great Protestant theologians of the 20th century once went on a vacation at the Sea of Galilee. They were German theologian Rudolf Bultmann, Swiss theologian Karl Barth, and German-American theologian Paul Tillich. They weren't only talking about all things religious, they also came together to enjoy some leisurely time fishing in the lake. One day, they took a boat and found a nice spot for fishing. After a while, they ran out of beverages, so Boltman got out of the boat, walked on the surface of the water to the shore, and returned a few minutes later with a few drinks. Soon after, they needed more to drink. This time, Bart got out of the boat, walked on the water to the shore, and fetched some more refreshments. And when they ran out of drinks again, it was Tillich's turn. He stepped out of the boat, touched the water, and started to sink. Well, the other two theologians immediately leaned overboard in an effort to rescue their unfortunate colleague from drowning. And as they got ready to pull, pull Tillich, who was still underwater, back into the boat, Boltman turned to Bartman and said, we should have told him where the stepping stones are. And then Bart looked at him and said, which stepping stones? Well, the joke confronts us tellingly with a major problem. How are we to interpret this miraculous story? How can we make sense of it? Did Jesus really walk on water, or is there a reasonable explanation for it, like walking on stepping stones? In particular, in the Enlightenment era, some 250 years ago, theologians sought to offer natural and plausible explanations for this and other miracles, and ever since, they have greatly influenced the course of interpretation of these passages to this day. With regards to multiplying the bread and fish, which was a gospel text for last Sunday, they felt that Jesus must have convinced the crowd to share the food that they had hidden in their garments with their hungry neighbor. And as for the miracle of Jesus walking on the water, they thought that Jesus was simply walking on the shore. It was just because of the reflection of the light, of the moonlight, that made it look like as if Jesus had been walking on the surface of the water. However, the biblical text suggests and states clearly that the disciples had already been somewhere in the middle of the lake and that Jesus was indeed walking toward them on the water. So let me say again what I said last week. Just because it is impossible for us human beings, it does not mean that it is impossible for Jesus, who is the Son of God, the co-creator of heaven and earth. As much as I can understand that our inquisitive human mind is looking for a reason behind a strange occurrence, we make, in my mind, we make a mistake when we try to find natural and plausible explanations to every problem. And when we do that, we might not see that there is a somewhat bigger and even more important picture behind these texts. After all, these texts, they want to tell us something about God and about our faith. So wouldn't it make sense to ask what the texts want to tell us about God and our faith? What is it that we are supposed to learn from these texts? This is where Peter comes in. Peter and his little faith. 
He got out of the boat and started to sink. When Jesus pulled him up again, he scolded him, Oh, you of little faith. And as I think of this incident with Peter, almost inevitably another character comes to my mind, a character from pop culture. And here he is, and I'm sure you recognize him. Of course, it is Wile E. Coyote. And I'm sure that you are familiar with the plot of his adventures. As he tries to catch the fast roadrunner, he quite often runs beyond the end of a cliff and keeps on running horizontally while he is still airborne. This is until the moment when he realizes that there is something wrong and that he is actually still bound to the rules of gravity. And at that moment, he stops running and looks at you in desperate anticipation of what is coming next. He fall into the deep abyss, which is accompanied by a loud thump when he hits the ground. Well, Peter as well fell. Peter as well was pulled down, in his case, into the water. When he tried to walk on water, just as Jesus had done, oh, indeed, if Peter's faith had just been bigger, then he could have done what these kids in the next picture can do. As students of the advanced level course of religious education, they manage to walk on the surface of the water in the pool. Oh, I wish that my faith would be that big. Peter, on the other hand, he found himself in a perilous situation, although I think we can learn a few things from him. We can learn a few things here from Peter and from the entire situation. For me, this passage serves as an example that it is meant to give us courage and assurance when we face dangerous moments in our lives. For example, in light of the COVID-19 threat that has dictated our lives for the last few months now, the Gospel text wants to tell us that the, the following message, No, I won't let it get me down. No, I won't let it get me down. And it's also with a bit of an irony here in these days, hold on to that hand. While we are not supposed you know, to touch hands, hold on to that hand that Jesus puts out to rescue you. And in the text, there is a small detail that we tend to overlook. But it is important for the entire Initially, Peter actually managed to walk on the water. Jesus encouraged him to leave the boat. He did. We also hear that he walked on the water and came closer to Jesus. But the moment when he saw the wind, and this is important, for this means that it happened when he got distracted and looked away from Jesus. That's when he started to sink. Distraction is something that we all know about. I, it can have a smaller and a larger impact. It all depends on the situation. Just take this rather common example. One person wants to throw a ball to you, and then there is another person as the other person um, is releasing the ball, and then another person ca is calling your name, and then you turn to the person who is calling your name, and in that moment, you get hit by the ball. Well, it hurts. It probably does hurt quite a bit. And here is another more serious example from a recent court ruling in Germany. A driver was found guilty that he got too distracted in his high-tech car. It was raining and he caused an accident. The car got damaged and fortunately the driver wasn't injured. When he had tried to adjust the speed of the wiper blades because of the rain, there was no handle by the steering wheel to do that. So to make that adjustment, he had to use the touchscreen monitor in front of him there in the middle in the center console. And this meant that he had to look down to the monitor. And during that moment, he did not look at the traffic and at the road conditions. He lost control of the car and drove into a ditch because it was owed to that distraction that had caused the accident. He had to pay a fine 
and his driver's license was revoked for a month. Bad things can and do happen when we get distracted. As we apply the lesson to our faith life, we could say the moment we take our eyes off of Jesus, and this is what Peter did, we may face some harm and damnation. There are moments in life when we face harm and storms, adverse wind and danger. On the other hand, when I listen to the stories of several of our members and the things that they had experienced in their life, I hear in their telling, without faith, they would have tumbled. Without faith, they might have drowned. Or to put it differently, it was their faith that gave them support in many stormy situations. It was their faith that carried them through their lives. Don't get me wrong. We can't deduce from this observation that a person of faith goes through life unharmed, while a person without faith endures all kinds of hardship. We know that this is not the case, for life is more complex than that. It can happen that a believer drowns and that a non-believer gets rescued. It is not only non-believers who get infected by COVID-19. Christians as well die because of the virus. And when we experience such difficult moments, maybe we would ask ourselves, we want to ask ourselves, what do we expect of our faith? That our faith may heal our wounds? or that it may give me orientation in life, or that it offers me spiritual food and nourishment. Sure, these are all good things that our faith may offer and give to us. But it can happen, and it does happen, that although we believe, our livelihood can be threatened severely. We can suffer misfortune and failure, the loss of job and income, relationships that break apart, illness, or maybe the death of a loved one. And all these are tremendous challenges in our lives and to our faith. Because of those moments, our faith could break and go to pieces, or we could use them as opportunities for our faith to grow. No, I won't let these things get me down. And yes, I reach for the hand that is put out toward me in an effort to rescue me. It is quite possible that we realize then that God offers us help, even from unexpected places. On a personal note, when I went through a difficult time in my life, when I faced a severe and serious crisis, I found some solace and help in an unlikely spot. It was the music from a German punk rock group, the Totenhosen. And to me, their music was not just noise. When I started listening to the lyrics, their songs became four-minute sermons to me, pronouncing unto me, as it is said in one of their songs, stand up when you're down on the ground. Somehow, life will go on. This somehow is, well, it is somehow vague. And yet, it was exactly this word somehow that directed me back to my faith, which brought me back to the origins and to the foundation of my faith, which I have in Jesus Christ. Psalm 18, as we heard in one of the lessons, Psalm 18 tells us, In my distress I called upon the Lord, to my God I called for help, and I as well called to the Lord so that he might come to my rescue. And I'm sure that there are more people who do that as well. It does not even cross the mind of my, many modern contemporary people to call out to God for help when they face problems or when they go through a crisis. They think that they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps well, this is as impossible as it is impossible for me to walk on water. But you know what? I do not have to walk on water. Nobody expects me to walk on water. 
But this is what I can do. I can turn to the one who did it. I can turn to Jesus who actually walked on water and stretched out his hand so that Peter could take it and be rescued. And I as well can accept this hand for my own rescue. For I have noticed without my faith in Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I will perish. I will drown in the raging storms of this life. And I began to wonder, how many people are drowning today and they are on the way, escaping from their old lives in hopes of starting a new and better life elsewhere? How many people reach the other shore safely? These questions also have a spiritual dimension so that we can ask further, how many children of God fall by the wayside on their way to eternal life because they are lacking faith? Or to put it differently, our faith in our Lord Jesus as the one who overcame the power of death carries us through stormy times. Let us not get distracted. Let us therefore not take our eyes off of Jesus. We won't allow those messy things around us to drag us down. For we have a Savior who wants to pull us to himself. Amen. We now hear our next hymn, Let Us Ever Walk with Jesus. Living together in trust and hope, let us profess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, life everlasting. Amen. Well, for the uh, last few weeks, it has been a habit that we are not collecting an offering during um, our worship service, uh, that it is possible to do that at the beginning, as you are coming in, or as you are leaving at the end of the service. And still, uh, that we do include a stewardship moment during our worship service. Today, the uh, clothing ceremony would have taken place for the uh, 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. But as we know, the games had to be cancelled. They had to be postponed due to the uh, to next year due to the uh, COVID-19 virus. The Olympics, they have written inspiring stories. Many athletes overcame severe obstacles and, and they persevered. It did not always translate into winning medals, but what they did conveyed the true spirit of the games that participating is more important than winning. John Stephen Aquari from Tanzania is one such example. He competed in the marathon race in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. He came in last of all the runners who finished that race, and he, ri he arrived more than an hour after the winner. After halfway through the marathon, he fell, badly wounding his knee and dislocating his shoulder. Because it had already gotten late when he arrived in the stadium, there was only a small crowd left to cheer on the man who limped to the finish line with a blood-soaked bandage around his knee. When Aquari was asked why he continued running, he answered, My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. Now, when we are looking at our spiritual lives, do we have it what it takes to finish? In life, we get bruised or beaten, but there is also a hospital, a spiritual hospital, if you will, in place for us that is a church and worship, where we get treated and bandaged up, where we can get all the support so that we can finish well with our journey of faith in this life. So I want to thank you for your perseverance, for your good spirits, for your faithfulness. I want to thank you for your support of your church so that we can continue with our ministry here at St. Peter's. So may God bless both the giver and the gifts you bring. Let us pray. Lord God, there are storms in our lives, yet you are our lifeline. You are with us every step in our lives. You guide us through this life, and you give us courage and hope. Strengthen us also to truly be your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus. And for all people according to their needs. For the priesthood of all the baptized, that they would be humble and merciful, faithful in their vocations, and grateful for the salvation they have in Christ Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a faithful prayer life among God's children, that they would call upon the Lord when in need, Give him thanks for the provisions he provides for the body and soul and praise him in everything. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For good government among us, 
that we might live in freedom and peace without violence or oppression. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those experiencing physical afflictions during this pandemic, that they would be delivered from every trouble and strengthened in their faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who receive Christ's body and blood this day, that they would be strengthened and preserved in the one true faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For faithfulness until this life's end, or until the day of Christ's return in glory, that we would be among the great multitude that no one could number in Christ's kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We remember the night when our Lord Jesus was betrayed, when he took bread, when he gave thanks, broke the bread, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat this. Is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after the meal, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all of them to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray with words that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life, now and forever. Amen. Receive the benediction. Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you now and forever. Amen. As for our closing hymn, um, let us hear Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.